we can maybe, oh, I got to take off that with you, but this is the next best thing. And, I, and it allows me to reach a lot more people like the citizen science program we're going to be talking about a little bit. Um, and just to reiterate, reiterate Noir Lab is your national observatory. So please feel free to come visit us at noirlab.edu whenever you'd like to learn about what kind of science people are doing and, and uh, the discoveries and stuff like that. There's a lot of exciting things happening out there. So what I, can everyone see my screen, first of all? Is that, is that see, seeable? Okay, good. And you can all hear me, obviously. Um, and so the second slide I want to show you here is uh, just to provide you with a glimpse of the observatories, because uh, I'm not sure how often you, you uh, encounter uh, any uh, photos from our observatories. They're really pretty, pretty cool. And I was just down in Chile a couple of weeks ago, um, and, uh, and I live near the one that's on the lower right-hand side. So we have the Saratololo Inter-American Observatory, and that's obviously on the mountain Saratololo. <laughs> that's the one uh, on your left-hand side, and that's in Chile. And then, as the name implies, we have the Gemini Observatory. They're twin observatories, and one is on Mauna Kea, and the other one, you know, in Hawaii, and the other one is uh, on Cerro Pachon, right across from Saratololo. You can see the uh, two sets of observatories from both mountaintops in Chile. And the, the one on the lower right, as I said, is Kitt Peak National Observatory. And that's the one that I'm nearest to. It's only about 65 miles away from where the headquarters are in the center of Tucson. And that's where I work at the headquarters. So, so I wanted to ask you guys, since this was a natural history society and museum, I wanted to start with something that would be really super familiar. I should actually ask if there's a lot of amateur astronomers in the audience. Can I see, does anyone, can anyone raise their little um, electronic hand to see if I have uh, amateur astronomers or professional astronomers in the audience? Anybody? Just kind of curious. One. Oh, hi, Megan. Anyone else? No? Well, Megan, it's nice to meet you as well as everyone else. But uh, so I, I thought I'd start with something that's pretty familiar especially with being members of the society. And uh, I start with a landscape and it's beautiful. It has a stream running through it, green grass, flowers, uh, lots of trees. And just if you would, in your mind's eye, pretend that it's a, been in your family for generations, this piece of land. And you know, it's inspired family members. Maybe uh, you have, your mom became an artist uh, your your daughter became a scientist, a biologist because of it. I mean, you know, just you know, it's been very inspirational. And then one day, the stream is polluted by a company upstream. What would you do, right? So, say now, imagine that the landscape is the night sky, the starry night sky, right? And it's beautiful. You see the Milky Way arching overhead, and so many stars you can't count them, right? And then one day it's polluted. And what would you do if you lived in one of these cities, these big cities that are obviously shown on this map, right? How could you prevent this from happening? And it's not just our enjoyment of the night sky. It's, it's uh, you know, that's a big thing that, that relates to our lives. But there are other things that also relate to our lives, uh, like the effects on uh, energy consumption, human health, wildlife, and our cultural heritage. So for billions of, of dollars each year are actually wasted uh, in energy consumption through unshielded lights that just kind of head up into, into space and not any of any use here on the ground. Uh, and then there's effects on our health. Uh, um, it, that includes things like disruption of our day-night cycle. That's basically what happens and that causes in turn uh, increases increased in risks for obesity, for depression, for sleep disorders, for diabetes, and things like that. And then you have wildlife, you have the habits and habitats of animals which are negatively affected, and some animals are actually pushed to the brink of, of survival. And so you have uh, examples of like uh, migrating birds, and they're confused by city lights, and they get exhausted and, and just you know, they, like in big cities, actually, they, they fall to the ground and die. Um, and there's a, a washed out sky also impedes us from viewing and astronomers from get, getting research to basically understand our universe. 
So the nice source, or the nice guy too, has been a source of inspiration, as I've mentioned, and wonder since the dawn of humanity. So our collective cultural heritage of the nice guy, obviously it's inspired many artists and like uh, not just scientists, but artists like Van Gogh with Starry Night, his beautiful painting, and Holst with his musical composition, The Planets, and Shakespeare with his sonnets and his various references to the moon, to the sun and whatnot. So with, with seeing fewer and fewer stars over the years due to light pollution, we are basically losing our source of inspiration, I would say. So let's go to the next slide and get this to work. <laughs> so one of the ways you can actually take an active part, believe it or not, is in protecting the night sky is to actually participate in Globe at Night. So it's a little um, add on my part because uh, I've been doing this as, as Bronwyn said for 17 years and it's been very successful. And I'll show you some of the ways it's been successful. Um, it has more than 180 countries involved and uh, two thirds of a million people pretty regularly participating. And we have close to 300,000 measurements at this point. So, um, and it's very easy to do. All you do is take a few minutes of your time at night uh, once every while, when this, when there's no moon overhead, guys, no moon, that's the secret. Because <laughs> the, the moon is a natural light bulb in the night sky. So you want to avoid the moon. And there's 10 days of the campaign each month when the, where the first half of the night does not have this moon in it. And we let you know what that is. And we also pick a constellation of the month, like, you know, the ice cream flavor of the month sort of thing. It's a, it's a constellation of the month. Uh, like Orion is a very, very big favorite at the very beginning of the year, typically. And you look, what you're doing, you're matching what you see towards that particular um, constellation with uh, seven or eight maps that we have on our on our app, basically on our website, um, that uh, you know have, have progressively fewer and fewer stars. Uh, so you, you will actually start with the, number one is very light polluted, and number eight is is very little light pollution. So um, I'll, I'll talk about that in just a minute in more detail. <clears throat> So on this particular map, what you're seeing here on the left-hand side, you see Europe is in the upper uh, panel on the left and the United States on the lower panel. And the, you see all these colored dots. And the, and the ones that are brighter are the ones with a brighter night sky. Um, so the ones towards white are the brightest. And the ones that are um, darker are the darker night skies. And I just want to let you know that. You'll see that in a couple different uh, maps. So I just want to let you know. But that's how we do things in, in the globe night land. Um, okay. What? The computer's not uh, being corporate here. <laughs> so, um, so let's just, if you don't mind, I'll take just a couple minutes and tell you about how to take some measurements because it's super, super, super easy. Uh, you you want to wait till more than an hour after sunset because that's when you know it's going to get into what they call astronomical twilight when it's past that point and you're into darkness. And you want your eyes to adjust for for young people it's 10 minutes for older people it's like 15 or 20 minutes sometimes um to adjust your eyes to the darkness around you so that you actually can actually see a little bit uh in the darkness and then you uh want to find the constellation in the night sky and uh usually just what we say on the global night website is, is enough or you can use an app there's a lot of free apps out there the star walk is what i use uh and star walk only costs Four dollars, and that's pretty pretty cheap for that for the amount of stuff that they actually get. Unless you do, so you take your phone, you can just lift it anywhere you want and tell where the constellation is, or you can actually type it in there and find the constellation. Very very easy. And then to, to actually take the globe at night measurements, you want to go obviously to the app. Well, we call it an app, but it's actually part of our website. You can use it easily on your phone as an app. You don't get it in the store. You have to go to the website globeatnight.org, and. Uh, and then uh, the first step is, is you know, you'll see the app. Oh, I don't know if I should, uh, darn it, I didn't get that out. Okay, well, anyways, <laughs> um, okay, you see the, I can go there if you want to, but it's very, very simple. You're gonna first put in your date, time, and location. And if you have a smartphone, guess what? It puts it in there for you, very, very easy. So you don't have to worry about a darn thing. And then the only thing you're really gonna be doing is choosing one of eight maps or charts that most resemble the constellation of the month. And so the first one will be like you are um, in, in New York City. 
And uh, so you don't see very many stars. It'll be chart one. And that maps onto something astronomers go, call a brightness scale called magnitude. So chart one is magnitude one. And it'll be like New York City. Chart three is like what you'd see in a typical medium-sized city, uh, like Tucson, where I live. Uh, chart five is where we just start to see the Milky Way galaxy arch overhead. So that's a kind of delineating factor. And chart seven is like you're in a national park somewhere. You see so many stars, you can't tell one constellation from another. So that's the kind of uh, scale you have before you. And I just picked out a few to give you examples. So once you, you just uh, highlight one of those that resembles most of what you see in the night sky and you leave it there, that's your choice. And so you're looking for the faintest star possible that you see in both situations, in the sky and on the charts. And once you find that, you're golden. You leave the, 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 um, the highlighted uh, box of the map there and you go on to the next thing, which just says, it asks you what your weather's like and what it is is four different pictures. One is clear sky and the last one is very, very cloudy. Over half the sky is cloudy, right? And you pick whatever, which one of the four resembles your night sky. Uh, weather, and uh, and you're basically done. If you have, and I, I'm sorry, I apologize, I forgot to get it out. If you have, uh, can you see my cursor at all? I don't know if you can see my cursor. You can. If you have one of these little um, card, uh, like pack of card sized, um, what they call sky quality meters. So a lot of amateur astronomers have it. Uh, teach. I've given out many to teachers all over the world, <laughs> and their students. Um, and you just, this is like an objective way to take a measurement. The higher the number, the darker the sky, and you just put it overhead and press the start button and read out the value. You can, you don't have to, if you have that kind of device, you can put it also into the globe at night um, measurements. And that's it. You just hit the submit button and you're done. You're done in like a minute's time or half a minute. It's really fast. Um, and so, um, I don't know, should I ask if there's any questions on that before I go on, or is that clear as a bell? I, I doubt it's clear as a bell, but <laughs> maybe it is. <laughs> That's okay, if they have questions, they'll put them in the chat box. Oh, okay, oh, I lost the uh, chat box there. Mm, let me just- And, uh, and then we can go over and uh, at the end. So. Okay. And for some reason, my, well, here it is, okay. There's two questions already. No, that was before, okay. Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, well, okay. So let me give you some examples of how many, how cool uh, some projects have been with, with students first. I'll give three slides on various ages of students, starting with elementary and middle schoolers, and what they've done with the Globe and I program. So innovative. And this is, it wasn't my idea. It was their idea, totally. Um, and so we have uh, uh, a school district in Indiana uh, where students actually asked, um, how much of the night sky have we lost? And so there were 3,700 students that each contributed at least one measurement to a map. And uh, from they were from a dozen elementary schools and about two, element, uh, two middle schools. And they um, built, to visualize their data, they actually built a Lego map. And the Lego map had 35,000 pieces in it. And each level, there were six levels, each level had a different color that represented the that brightness that I told you about, that, that magnitude, uh, uh, stellar magnitude that I mentioned in the last few slides. And uh, and they then they had you know seven uh, six layers of it, uh, 35,000 Legos, and they took away uh, about 12,000 of them to represent their data, right? And so they were left with the green and blue colors, which are like, uh, actually not that bad. There's the magnitude, uh, limiting magnitude, they call it four or that's, that's the faintest star you can see is four or five. That means, so they were able to see down to four or five. So they could see a lot of the, you know, a couple thousand stars, at least in the night sky. That was pretty good. And this went on stage, on stage. <laughs> this went to their library and set the, you know, the city, the city um, actually celebrated this at their library for at least a year and it got a lot of media attention. So kudos to those kids. That was really amazing. And then we had high schoolers and some amateur astronomers team up to take an inventory of their city. And uh, you see this box that's really lit up in the center of the picture, that was the university business at the upper left-hand part, all businesses and then residential areas where the darker colors are. And it was amazing that they did this. They did this because they needed to have evidence. 
why their city council should make the laws stricter for light pollution, right? And they succeeded, it took two years. <laughs> and some of these kids graduated, unfortunately, but uh, it took two years and then they were they succeeded in actually strengthening the laws, which was very amazing. And most, you know, a lot of it was based on the fact that they did this survey. So and that was with orbit night data. Then we had undergraduates, uh, a couple of undergraduates who worked with me, worked on this particular project. It was an incredible project. It looked at the threatened and endangered species of bat called the lesser long-nosed bat. And uh, they uh, tend to um, come to Tucson for maybe half the year. And they uh, tend to settle in the Saguaro National Park East in, in Tucson and traverse every single night to get food. They're nectivorous bats. So they, they um, uh, usually um, go to agave plants for their nectar in, in uh, the surrounding area here. And they purposefully, for what we didn't know at first, the Arizona game and fish who we worked with on this project could not answer the question at first, why were they circumventing the city center? And you can see from this map, the higher, the, the lighter color, the very center of the map is the center of Tucson and the mountains are uh, where the green areas are at the upper um, right. So they were, they were between the city center and the mountains going around the city center to get to something called Push Ridge on the northeast corner of the upper left, where they ate and came back by the morning. So it was very interesting. And they came up with, they did all this analysis, all this <laughs> math, and, um, and, and they were able to do this because they had radios. They put radios on the little legs of the poor little um, bats. But anyways, and that was a process we actually got to do with them too. But um, by morning, um, they would come back and they found out through all this analysis, this math and stuff, that it was three, preferentially three little, three different areas that they were, um, uh, um, that could be a factor. One was light pollution. Uh, another was called echo region, which I'm not, I can't quite, this is a few years back now. And that was vegetation. So there's three regions, uh, three, I'm uh, sorry, uh, reasons why, um, and it wasn't just light pollution. So, uh, but it, it was a factor. So very interesting stuff that, that Global Night has been a part of. And this is cool too. This is called BioBlitz. And National Geographic at least used to do this BioBlitz every year with a national park across the United States. And more than 10 years ago, Tucson was a part of this. We have two national parks, one on either side of the city. So I'm gonna circle one of them now on the right-hand side, that's the East Park. And then there's the West Park on the left-hand side and the city is in between. I think, hopefully you can see my cursor. And uh, so we had the Boy Scouts over here on, in the Western Park. We had the Rangers, which is a tougher terrain on the Eastern Park. And we had uh, mostly amateur astronomers and some people from the public go across four major roads or arteries through the town. And, um, and each of them taking data and a lot of them with the sky quality meters, we've lent out a lot of sky quality meters. And they got uh, a beautiful map you can see here. And the brightest area is the very center of town. Um, it's almost white, this dot. And it had a hundred percent, it was hundred percent brighter than the easternmost part over here in the Rincon Mountains. So it was really kind of interesting. So there's a factor of a hundred between those two locations in brightness. That got a lot of media attention as well. And then just to mention a couple more things before I dive into um, a paper that we did recently, and then that'll be basically the end of the talk. But um, we had we've had a lot of very 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 interesting partnerships, partnerships that would just knock your socks off because one of them, for instance, was with the Australasian Dark Sky Alliance. And I tell you guys, if you get involved and go up at night, you can, I mean, at least I have gotten to know people all over the world and it's very exciting. And these people are very dedicated to, you know, dark sky preservation and they wanted to make, uh, make a, a Guinness Book of World Records. <laughs> and they did this by actually taking the most globe at night measurements in one night basically. And they took 6,700 measurements in one night. And so that was an effort by the whole country. I, I can tell you, mostly people on the East Coast, as you can see there, that's where all the yellow dots are. And some on that lower West Coast there. And this is their longest night of the year, which is our shortest night of the year, because uh, they're in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, and that was very exciting too. We've had a number of other really pretty cool, um, you know, with museums too. Uh, uh, partnerships. So think about that. If you ever want to do something like that in the future, let me know. 
the last slide before we get on to the paper I wanted to show you is something that was um, kind of near and dear to my heart because there are opportunities sometimes that just come up and you just it just you know bowls you over. There were two young ladies who are twins, sisters, that are, were Girl Scouts and uh, they really wanted to do something for other kids. So they decided that they wanted to make a Dark Skies webpage all about light pollution and what kids could do. And it still is there. It's this Dark Sky for Kids, as you see there, the number four instead of the letter, the, the name for. So Dark Skies for the number four kids.org. And uh, they won the Silver Award. They This is for the Silver Award. They did this for the Girl Scouts. And they also uh, won the Rising Star Award from what is now known as Dark Sky instead of IDA, it's Dark Sky International. And uh, the Presidential Service Award as well. So these, you know, they're go getters, these young ladies, and uh, more power to them. And uh, and so um, this and other things we've done as well. And I just wanted to highlight that particular one. So any questions on, on all these activities so far? Or I guess you want me to wait, sorry. I usually ask people because people forget their questions sometimes. But um, but I can go on if you want me to broadly. It's just a couple more slides. Okay, um, all right. So let me get down to... Um, so this is a recent paper, it came, it came out in January. I mean, not that recent now, but it <laughs> came out in January and it used the Globe at Night data. And there was a guy in Germany with his students, it's Chris Kaiba, very well known in our circle for, for doing research on uh, light pollution. And his student, Yijit Owner Altinas, I can never say her last name very well, but, and, and then Mark Newhouse who works with me, uh, and uh, and we investigated the change in the global brightness from um, the, the, using the global night data from 2011 to 2022, and uh, we used about 51,000 data points from global night because you have to toss out some that have moonlight and stuff like that. There's different reasons why you toss out data, and um, and uh, so this is all um, this is published in a paper that is in a journal called Science, pretty pretty well known journal. Um, and it's the, the reference is shown here. And I'll just say some of the graphs, but um, but um, I'll explain it. Um, so there's a um, the, the number of visible stars we we just decided decreased by an amount that can be explained pretty much by almost an increase in sky brightness of almost I should say ten percent. So um, that was the best way to describe it. And this is in what we can see visually. I'm talking about that kind of brightness. Um, and then, so that's that's pretty much equivalent to doubling the brightness, the sky brightness, every eight years. So that's what that means. So, and if you go to this is uh, this is what I was talking about now. So this is the, a slope of, of um, basically um, brightness versus the years, and it going down like this means it gets actually getting brighter. But if you take into account uh, a, a pretty much almost 10% slope of, of, of increase in brightness. You take that, you subtract that out, you should get a horizontal line. And that's what happened here. So um, basically um, the simplest explanation was that every year the brightness would increase by 9.6%. And so, and this is a faster increase than the emission changes indicated by satellite observation. So there's two satellites that have been taking data for over 20 years, one after the other, and they overlap a little bit. And um, they are insensitive, not sensitive to blue light whatsoever. And in the last 10 years plus, we've had the uh, revolution or, or evolution of the use of uh, LEDs. And LEDs primarily come out in blue light. Um, now I think they're getting a little bit better, but for at least the last 10 years, that's pretty much how it's been. So these satellites have not been sensitive to blue light, and that's something to realize. So, they, so their estimate of 2% is a, is a low-balling the estimate, very low estimate. It's not in truth what's going on, so it's probably closer to the 10% that we got from the globe at night data. So that's something to kind of realize. And, and so, uh, <laughs> um, There's basically two conclusions um, you can get from all this. And the first is that the visibility of stars is deteriorating and well, a little bit rapidly, I would say. 
despite or perhaps because of the introduction of LEDs in outdoor lighting. Um, and existing policies, existing lighting policies are not preventing very well the increase in what we call sky glow. And that's the you know cumulative glow of light pollution over the cities, basically. Uh, and that's pretty much on big scales I'm talking about because the globe at night data is hard, hard to pinpoint a location. You have to take an aggregate of an area, basically. So if you take in consideration global scales or you know continent scales or country scales, that's where, where you can make this kind of conclusion, but not really uh, cities because um, not every year city from you know is city data is contributed consistently from globe at night. There's some a lot of cities that do, but not every city in the world. So so we have to take it more on a bigger scale when we say these things. But nonetheless, it's been. Um, I think fairly conclusive in terms of citizen science data. Um, and so the second is that um, the use of this data, the citizen science data, uh, provides very good uh, complementary information to, or even better information to the satellite data that I mentioned earlier. And uh, and we couldn't do it without the citizen scientists across the world because, you know, I can't, as I said, mentioned before, I can't be everywhere and uh, scientists can't be everywhere. We need citizen scientists to take this kind of data and to submit it to our program. Um, and these are kind of the studies we can do with it. And, um, and we thank people for that. So what's the bottom line here in terms of what we can do? Um, so sky glow, I do feel the sky glow from light pollution can be reduced, but it takes, it takes a village. It takes everybody's involvement. Um, and, I, and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll talk about this now, but I was going to uh, actually mention in the last slide that, um, so it, in short, you, you, can, you can use outdoor lights only when and where and how they are needed. To, and you want to minimize blue light content and you want to also fully shield the fixtures. And I'll talk about that in just a little more detail in a second. Another bottom line is that um, more effort is needed um, to put these kind of recommendations I just mentioned into ordinances and bylaws and other regulations in order to slow down and hopefully reverse uh, the degradation of our, our shared night sky. Um, and, but the good news is that some of these laws have already come into fruition. We just got an announcement a few days ago from the country of Chile. The whole country now has a national light pollution law and uh, and the, the whole the crux of it now is is enforcing the law, and that's that'll they, they have plans for that, but it takes effort. Mexico, on the other hand, too, a few years ago, has also developed a national law. So you have the South America, Central America, and now we have to look at North America and see what we can do to make I don't know if it's going to be possible, but to make a national law for the U.S. Wouldn't it be wonderful? So just to uh, end on uh, this note here, uh, this is the Globe at Night. And these are the last <laughs> two campaigns of the year. We will continue next year. Uh, I will have dates shortly. I don't have them right now. I've been busy with a number, number of other things, um, but we will have those dates shortly. And mostly what it is, you start basically with uh, third quarter and go to new moon, basically. And there's those, those 10 days that kind of envelop those dates typically for each month where you go from third quarter to new moon. And that means the first part of the evening at least will not have the moon in it. And you can uh, definitively take globe at night measurements. So, um, okay, so let me see. Um, all right. And so I just want to mention, let's say that uh, I'm going to get my on my soapbox here just for a second. <laughs> Um, so as we overcome our ancient instincts telling us to always push for more light, we have to remember to simply look up more and enjoy our cultural heritage, the starry night sky. Join us in protecting it. And thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Connie. That was wonderful. And we can come back here. I'm going to put a spotlight on you. And then uh, we can do some we can do some Q and A. I know I have a lot of questions, but right here 
We have um, Alan asked when you were talking about the app itself and, and the how-to, you said the dimmest star. Did you mean the dimmest star in the constellation of the, yes. of the, of that? You can explain that again. Yeah, that's a super good question. Um, did Alan want to present, to, to, to say that again, or do you want me to say it? I'm sorry. No, you can go ahead and answer. Okay. Uh, yeah. So you, you want to look at the constellation that is the constellation of the month. So the best way to start out if you've never done Globe at Night is to actually start at the beginning of the year where they have Orion, which is the most, you know, very distinguishable uh, constellation. I think most people know Orion. It looks like an hourglass in the night sky, and it, it, it's a huge constellation. And so what you're looking at, just that area of the constellation, and you're comparing what you see toward it with the seven or eight maps that we have online. Um, there's, I, I say seven or eight because one of them doesn't really count. <laughs> it's like you have all clouds, basically. So the other seven uh, are the ones that I told you before uh, have the limiting magnitude one through seven. And the, the higher the number, the darker the sky and the fainter stars you will see. You'll see more stars and more dim stars if you don't have basically light pollution, right? So uh, that's what you're looking for. And you're not counting stars because you'll be there all night in the national park. You'll never <laughs> never get to just enjoy the night sky. So you're looking just for the faintest star. And if you see it in both places, you know wh whatever you think is a bunch of faint stars there, and you see it in both in the charts and in the sky, then that's the one you want to choose. It's pretty simple, actually. I can't, I, there's a very small print, so you might have to read it for me, I'm sorry. Yeah, I will. And then Richard asked, can we tell whether atmospheric pollution, particulate matter, et cetera, is increasing or not, thus increasing the reflectivity of the sky accounting for your observation? Yes, actually, it's been shown, I think, back in 2012 that increase in, in, in uh, air pollution actually does increase in light pollution. Uh, and, uh, and because of those reasons you just gave. And, and so it can be a factor. And uh, there haven't been a whole lot of studies since then. So it would be nice if someone could get, uh, could be involved in, or you know, start more studies on that particular issue. Because I just think his name was Harold Stark, um, who did this study. And I can't remember where he's from right now. But it was um, presented first at the American Geophysical Union meeting in December of 2012. Hmm. And then Jean is going, um, using the app, is brightness data when traveling useful or only the data from the same location for the same days? Oh, well, you know, both. Because, <laughs> you know, we, you know, we can only really use data that has been, rep you know, been done year after year after year, not, not always every year, but as many years as possible from the same location. But we appreciate it when people go on trips and take measurements as well, because it's new, new places. We wanna get as many places around the world as we possibly can. So both, both are good, thank you. So that's a good question. Oh. Thank you, it's, it's Connie though. Megan's gonna get, you're gonna get you, you got a new data point. Megan's a new data point here. There you go, she's gonna be joining Globe at night today. So my question is, is the data, when you talk about the schools using it, is the data available for anybody to download and use? Yeah, see, recently they upgraded um, the website, but sometimes upgrades aren't exactly how you intend them to be. <laughs> so we had it so that you could download the entire data set per year. And right now, I think they're having, they, they could do it for past years, but the current year should still be able to do it. Um, but they, they haven't allowed for that CVS file to be accessible for some reason. And I keep interacting with the IT team and I still have to keep interacting with the IT team <laughs> until it's done, but it'll be done soon. I keep, you know, I think they're tired of hearing from me. So. <laughs> hmm. So I have a question about that. One of the first slides, you said that billions of dollars, billions with a B could be saved if, the lighting was changed. Um, that and I, I, you said that Chile, what Chile was the first one to to kind of come on. Do are there any um, concrete uh, uh, examples of municipalities or places who have insti in, 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 uh, instituted these changes and have seen a uh, change in their bottom line? 
yeah, I can't quote them offline, but there are a lot, there are a number of cities. I mean, Tucson, for instance, changed out uh, 20,000 lights, but they did, they changed them out to good LEDs, not, you know, they were below 3000 Kelvin. The ones above 3000 Kelvin have a lot of blue light. And so they were, uh, they, they were at the time that the upper level recommendation was not going over, a, a, they call it a color temperature of 3000 Kelvin. And so they, they did that and they saw a 7% reduction in the uh, sky glow above the city. Now, I don't know what that translated into, but they, they were doing that. It says in the article, if I could find it for you, that they did it because they would save, at least in their case, millions of dollars a year. So I have to look to see what it was but for you, but uh, it was a big savings that were supposed to happen. And I haven't heard too much more since then. It was a few years back in 2019. So. And another question, uh, um, y'all feel free to raise your hand if you want to ask uh, Connie a question or put it in the chat box, but I'll just keep asking mine. Uh, what, could you explain again why, what the problem is with the blue light, why we should stay away from blue, the blue light spectrum? Is it just because of the satellite or it seemed like there were some other factors? No, no, it's not the Yeah. Uh, um... The blue light um, at night, not, not not so much the daytime, but we're very diurnal animals and uh, we need the night as much as we need the day. So um, in, the, in the day, it's fine to have blue light. That's how we're, we're sort of built in order to do that. But at nighttime when we're sleeping, we uh, don't want our um, melatonin levels to, to increase. We want, uh, I'm sorry, we don't want them to be uh, I haven't talked about this for a long time, so I might get this backwards, but it's the melatonin levels that are affected. I think they're depleted if you have too much light, blue light, and that's not good for our, our, our circadian rhythm, basically. It's tied to our day-night cycle and our, our, um, our uh, sleep cycle, basically, and if you don't get enough sleep, that ties into a number of medical conditions or even diseases, so there's ties to actually for some women with breast cancer, and, and you know, the, the, I would have to say, in all fairness, the conclusions for that are not solid, but there's a lot of studies that have shown that to be true. You know, you have to kind of, you know, I'm trying to be a scientist here now. So there's indications, and there's also indications for, uh, and I can tell you guys, unless you don't want to, there's another type of cancer called, well, prostate cancer, and that's been ties to that as well. So, and then there's di ties to diabetes too, because you're, you, you know, you, um, Again, you're you're changing. Um, uh, well, it's mostly on sleep deprivation that, that this is all going on, and uh, that can have an effect on a number of different ways, and even obesity. That's amazing, um, and I, I think I, I fall in a couple of those categories myself, unfortunately. And so that all, and so that has to do more with not light pollution, but with the how it affects. Uh, uh, the blue light that lowers the, the melatonin levels and they're supposed to replete at night when you're sleeping, right? But if you have too much blue light on at night, like you're watching TV for a good fraction of the night every night, it's not just one time. You have to do it on a regular basis, right? Like a, a nurses, a shift, a work, you know, shift workers at night who, who uh, had this study for breast cancer actually, and they, they found to be very prevalent among, amongst these nurses. Um, so they worked every night under blue light for many years. So you, you know you kind of have to do it repeatedly. Uh, so that's why it's good to use things like there's a, a flux, uh, a reduction in flux for your phones for, you know, that you can use and for your computer uh, so that you don't have as much blue light that you're looking at at night. That's when it's it, it makes a difference. It's not really in the daytime. Does that make it? All right. Work? Yeah, that's great. Oh, it's scary, but it's great. Um, Pam, Pam wants to know where do you get the um, sky quality meters, and do oh. you have any that you recommend? Yeah, okay. The ones we've used, we've gotten hundreds over the years, and the guy, and I'll tell you, you get a discount, hopefully still, if you say you're doing globe at night. And uh, I don't know if you can do that. You have to probably email the guy. But um, uh, so the. Unihedron, U-N-I-H-E-D-R-O-N.com is the company in Canada that we get the um, get the uh, meters from. And they're typically something like $135. But if you say you're doing it for Globe at Night, which I hope you 
are doing it for COVID night when you say this. <laughs> you get it for $85, so it's for $50 off. It's amazing. So that made a difference for us when we put together educational kits, which we used to do, um, that taught about dark skies education, basically, and how to, you know, abate light pollution. Um, and uh, we would give them out with the kits. You know. Wow, that is a huge discount on that. Good way to go. Yeah. Um, Richard says, uh, oh, let me see. Let me see. It says uh, unihedron.com. Did I get it right, unihedron? You did. That's perfect. Okay. There you go. Um, sure. Uh, Richard asks, it seems like light pollution would set a basic limit on what terrestrial telescopes are able to resolve. Is that correct? That is totally correct. And you'll notice that there are observatories that near like LA, like Griffith Observatory, can't really do any research. Uh, there's there's observatories just a little further out now of LA that are beginning not to be able to do as deep research as they used to. What I mean by that is a telescope you can think of as a time machine looking back in time. And the further back in time you want to look, the better your instrument has to be in being sensitive enough to reach that that um, dimness, basically, you know, the, the faint objects that are there. So you have to have something that you can't have a lot of light pollution so that, you you know, light pollution will contribute to brightening the sky instead of allowing you to, to look further, further back in time to something that's even fainter. So that kind of puts the kibosh on doing research at a certain level if your telescope is closer to a city. So are they going to have to take down those telescopes and uh, and then move them to a place where there's different, where there's a better better visibility? Well, they build new telescopes, different places, and then they make a facility like Griffith into a museum that people can enjoy. Alan says that the the that naked eye is looking back in time too. It is, but it can't look as far back in time because <laughs> we have a limit to what we can see. We can only see a few thousand stars, whereas if you have a telescope, you could see much further, you know, and more more objects. Now, if you are in a city, if you live in a suburb and things like that, where I mean, and you're taking these measurements for um, the it's you mentioned that you should try to turn off the lights of your house or what, but you you know you're just um, are there any strategies for that? You just want to go in the middle of the street by a street light or, or, or not, or try to be in the driveway or, you know, just as a, a typical suburban setting, what would be the strategy? For, for taking global night measurements? I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You probably want to, you know, if it's allowable and I have to, you know, of course you have to be safe, right. And walking around you have, I would actually uh, turn off as many lights around your house as you possibly can, and then stand outside and get your eyes adapted to the darkness before you move around too much, right? Um, and then you just go to a place where you can, you know, have a good view overhead, not too many trees in the way and stuff like that, or not no trees in the way if it's possible, and try to find your constellation and take measurements, right? So that's pretty much what personally I do. <laughs> so around my house. Does that make it, is that clearer or? Oh yeah, yeah, that's clear. I just didn't know if there were any other, you know, that's things pretty that we needed. <laughs> I'm making it more difficult than it needs to be. <laughs> yeah, the only instrument you really need is your are your eyes and <laughs> the connection to the internet, I guess. There you go, Alan. All we need is our our eyes. All right. Yeah. Any other questions for Connie tonight on uh on globe at night, uh light pollution? Um, anything, ask her anything. I'm sure she'll. <laughs> All right. Well, well oh, what are the new laws in Chile? Oh my goodness. Uh, well, there's a, a number of them. Some of them are, are uh, strict in terms of the kinds of um, lights you can use and not brighter than a certain limit. Uh, some of them are actually have to do with um, the wildlife, affecting the wildlife, uh, felt affecting human health and the bioenvironment, basically. It's, it's, it's pretty impressive. They, they're, they're hitting it at various levels. 
and addressing various ways that light pollution has affected our lives. I mean, I could go into the details, but we kind of, I mean, I could, if you want, I have some literature I could send you, um, Bronwyn, if you want to share it. But um, yeah, so. Sure, feel free to send it and I can uh, send it out to the to the folks that were here. Um, and that, let's see, Alan has said, uh, uh, the photo that you showed with the sky full of filled stars, so that was the sky looked like in the dark spaces. All areas of the night sky look like that or just certain areas? Oh, I would say most areas would look like that if we didn't have any night light, lights on at all. Uh, there are, you know, we do have the, the conditions that you, that I, I think it was you that said earlier, uh, you have air pollution, so that's a factor. You do have the natural background of uh, the aurora borealis or something else, a so zodiac light that might get in the way but it won't really, to me it would really would, would not be in the way <laughs> um but yeah it would look pretty beautiful like that i would i would hope and think alan says i've missed so much as an amateur astronomer that i never experienced that so thank you so much yeah and i think we, we've been I've been learning so much about the ice age. I'm, I'm chewing back in the, the last glacial maximum when we had the humans on earth. That was the kind of, that was the kind of scene that they got to see at night as they are chomping on some uh, woolly mammoth bones around the, around the fire. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's their night sky. Yeah, 10,000 years ago or so, mm -hmm. yeah, I would think. That was the last yeah. ice, the ice age, right? 10,000 years ago? Yeah. Yep, that was when it was. That was when it was. Um, all right, this has been amazing. Thank you for being the mod. Okay, that's me. Um, and then my last question is because I, you know, we we all switch to the LEDs because of energy things. So you would think that you would start seeing a cumulative, you know, decrease in the light pollution if we're use if the if the LEDs are 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 less fluorescent or what period so we're not we're not getting any benefit on that side of things or well, it depends on what led you use when they started out manufacturing them they were basically um white leds with a lot of blue light in them and that was not good very high temperatures like 5,000 kelvin um and as time progressed they became better at manufacturing lower um uh, temperature leds and some of them are um Phosphor coated amber LEDs, and there's another one that's called um, uh, narrowband amber LEDs, or something like that. So there's a couple different kinds of LED lights that are very low temperature, like less than 3,000. Some of them are 2,500 or 2,200. They're getting much better, and um, and those are the kind of lights you want to shoot for for street lights and and you know things that are under 3,000 for if you have any LEDs you want to put into your home. And, but the but the um, Another factor is you really have to shield the light so that all the light is directed downwards and not at an angle at, you know, so you, you don't want to produce glare. That's, that's a, that's a big thing that prevents people from seeing in front of themselves. Like if you have headlights coming at you, right? That's a lot of glare. I, as I get older, unfortunately, my eyes are more sensitive to light at night. And when I drive, I have to be very careful that there's not, you know, one of these highlights, highlighted, uh, car lights aimed at, at me as I'm driving, because I don't be able to see personally. So, <clears throat> so glare is a big factor. And, uh, and uh, so, yeah, so you, you want to shield. And so, and then, so that <laughs> what they say is you want to see this, the um, output of the light on the ground, but not the source of the light. So the light has to be like a cup around the light. So you don't actually see the source of the light. So that's, that's something to really, take into consideration, not just the type of the light, but how the fixture is oriented, right? And, and it's All good. Right. Uh, LEDs, I have to say, are energy efficient, much more so than lights in the past type. And so that's a good thing. They also can turn off and on very easily, much more easily. You can control that a whole lot better than previous lights. And, and they are getting better. So, you know, we're just, we're improving and, uh, so just stay tuned, <laughs> I guess. All right. Well, thank you so much, Connie. And thank you all for joining us tonight for Must Learn Thursday. It's always a pleasure to spend time and learning and get smarter with everybody. And you've given us 
not only information, you've given us the opportunity to get in more involved and become our data collector. So I hope that you start getting some new points from Maryland area popping up in your data set. Um, I know that I'm going to get out there and try. And I know that Megan said that she is. So hopefully there'll be some more of us doing that. And um, also, you know, more information about lights and what we can do. And I think we're going to all be paying a little bit more attention to as we drive around and see the lights and start being part of that um, part of that uh, solution and trying to make things a little bit darker uh, in a good way. Well, thank um, you so much too. And someone's uh, hand to Virginia. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So I'm reading. I'm trying to read mm -mm, the small print here. <laughs> but thank you everybody for all of your comments and thank you for inviting me. It's been a, a, an extreme pleasure, and I, I love sharing information about how to you now reduce light pollution and how to participate in global light. Oh, last quick oh, question. Alan. Alan oh, question. Yeah. Hi, last quick question. So I know why I got interested in astronomy and I'll tell you that in a second, but how did you get interested in this? Oh my gosh, I gotta tell my age. <laughs> I was a tiny little wee thing when man landed on the moon or humanity landed on the moon. And that was hugely inspiring because here you had them on a totally separate planetary body, basically, right? And looking back at the earth, that's what really got me. Looking back at the earth uh, and seeing the earth for the first time out, you know, outside of, of uh, just our, our environment. And that, and then I had the first run of Star Trek <laughs> that really, really, really inspired me as well. And I just, you know, it just escalated from there. <laughs> and, and for me, it was my second and third grade teacher. She made this, we did, a, I guess she did a unit on the planets in space. And she made this like wall display on cardboard. And she knew that I was like blown away by this. So at the end of the unit, she actually gave that to me. Wow. And, you know, I was just inspired. And I've got somewhere, my son in California has a box. I've got old, they, they were called NASA fax books. They were in black and white of like the first lunar landers. And, you know, I, they're these old pamphlets. You just used to write to NASA and they would send you stuff yes. for free. Yes. So I, I've got some of those. I've got to get them back. <laughs> so the, the lithographs, right? Of various lithographs. I remember getting lots of those when I would write to them. Yeah, they're like, yeah, they're just like maybe eight pages sort of fold over kinds of things. Oh, my goodness. Oh, that's, yeah. I remember something like that, too. So and, and keep doing space stuff, Natural History Society, because I love the space stuff. I mean, actually love all the stuff you do, but this stuff really is is great. Well, thank you. Well, thanks, thanks, Alan. I mean, we we try to get we try to touch on uh, on everything. There's a lot. Of, there's a lot. There's a lot in natural history, and Pam Pam has those NASA fact books too. So y'all have something in common there. <laughs> all right, she's aging herself also. <laughs> <laughs> Well, again, everybody, thank you for, for coming and getting smarter with us. And thank you, Connie, for sharing your knowledge, expertise. And um, stay well, uh, stay curious, stay outside. Go outside right now and look up, see what you can see. And uh, it's, it's, it's a beautiful night out there. So I, that's where I'm heading right now. Take, take care, everybody. Here. Still daytime here for me. <laughs> still, yeah, yeah, you've got to wait a little bit. But we're, we're, we're in the darkness, so. <laughs> So take care, everybody. All right. See you again. See you soon. Bye bye. Bye.